the verses. Verse 1 Always cherish others with loving kindness. I shall see all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling gem. To accomplish their ultimate benefit, I vow to cherish them with loving kindness at all times. Every genuine practitioner should have such an aspiration. We should regard all sentient beings wandering in samsara throughout the three realms as more precious than the wish-fulfilling gem. It is because the wish-fulfilling gem can only grant us temporary benefits, such as wealth and treasures. It cannot grant us the greatest benefit, the ultimate nirvana. Sentient beings, however, comprise a sublime field of merit. By sowing the body's seed in this field, we can harvest both temporary happiness in samsara and the ultimate peace of liberation. This message is clear. To accomplish their ultimate benefit, we shall help all sentient beings to attain ultimate happiness. In other words, we shall lead all sentient beings, including ourselves, to achieve the perfect Buddhahood. If you have developed wisdom, then the I mentioned here is not the conventional self we usually refer to. Instead, it is the self of permanence, bliss, self and purity taught in the Nirvana Sutra. Thus, we can naturally see all sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling gem and aspire to accomplish their ultimate benefit, because all sentient beings are in our true nature. We often talk about seeing our true nature. What we refer to is our Buddha nature. The aspiration prayer we often recite, I vow to save all sentient beings in the true nature, carries the same meaning as this verse. If you understand it, you will see that the reference in both sentences are the sentient beings in our true nature. Therefore, all sentient beings is synonymous with all sentient beings in the true nature. To accomplish their ultimate benefit, I vow to cherish them with loving kindness at all times. There is a transition here. First, cherishing them with loving kindness, and then aspiring for their attainment of perfect Buddhahood. For instance, for the perfection of generosity, which is one of the six perfections, without sentient beings, there would be no recipients for the acts of giving. Thus, there would be no way for us to practice generosity. As for the perfection of discipline, afflictions arise due to sentient beings. Without them, how could we practice ethical discipline to counteract afflictions? Furthermore, regarding the perfection of patience, Shanti Deva said, Without harm, patience does not arise. If there were no resentment of sentient beings, there would be no opportunity to practice patience, nor would there be the merit of cultivating patience. By extension, the perfections of diligence, concentration and wisdom also rely on sentient beings. Therefore, without sentient beings, it would be impossible to accomplish the six perfections and the countless practices of a bodhisattva. Thus, achieving the supreme Buddhahood would merely be an unattainable dream. Without sentient beings, we cannot attain Buddhahood. On the other hand, 
our afflictions also arise due to sentient beings. Without sentient beings, we would not have afflictions. Therefore, we influence each other. If you make others ordinary beings, they will also make you an ordinary being. In the end, you all become ordinary beings. Buddhahood is also achieved collectively by all beings. Is this the way of sentient beings? They afflict each other and in the end all become ordinary beings. They stay together in the human realm, the heavenly realm and even hell. They wander through the six realms of samsara, vexing each other. However, to attain enlightenment, you must support each other. For example, if you give someone a gift, they will also give you a gift. Hence, you help each other cultivate the perfection of generosity. If you practice patience with someone, they will also practice patience with you. Thus, you help each other cultivate the perfection of patience. Ultimately, you return to your true nature together. That is why we say, I vow to save all sentient beings in the true nature. I vow to eradicate all afflictions in the true nature. The four-line verse of aspiration composed by the Chinese patriarch is intriguing. I vow to save all sentient beings in the true nature. I vow to eradicate all afflictions in the true nature. Take your time to ponder it. Why is it said in this way? Because, in reality, there are no sentient beings in the Dharma realm. That is why we say, sentient beings in the true nature. We are all sentient beings arising from our true nature. If we help each other to complete the practices, we will return to our true nature. We are all bubbles arising from our true nature, like waves in the ocean, rising and falling. Each individual may seem to have a sense of self, but in reality there is no inherent self. We are all caught in the wrong attachment, believing in the existence of I and you clinging to thoughts like, I have great merits, or you are a Dharma protector. In reality, there is no inherent self. We talk about breaking free from the attachment to self every day, but I don't know if you have done it or not. Without the notion of self, we are all equal and attain Buddhahood together. If you are free from self-grasping, you will understand what it means to vow to save all sentient beings in our nature. Who saves whom? It is sentient beings who help us achieve Buddhahood. In other words, the Buddha drags us from the front while sentient beings push us from behind, enabling us to attain Buddhahood. This is the journey to enlightenment for each individual. The Buddhas and Buddhasattvas guide us from the front while sentient beings help us from behind. From another perspective, everything is illusory. Buddhas and sentient beings are all illusions without inherent existence. In appearance, on the road to enlightenment, The Buddha guides us from the front while sentient beings help us from behind. Therefore, we should be grateful to sentient beings as they help us accomplish the practices of patience, generosity, discipline, diligence, concentration and wisdom. We should not harbour resentment towards sentient beings because without harm, Patience does not arise. 
If we wish to cultivate patience, we must be grateful to sentient beings. Without sentient beings disturbing us, we would not have the circumstances to practice patience. We may not even realize the need for such practice. This is indeed the case. As you practice, you may think, Wow, I am free from afflictions. I have already attained enlightenment. However, your feeling of tranquility is actually because no one disturbs you. If you live in a place without any harm, read sutras, meditate, can enter concentration and seem to have wisdom, you may think you have already attained enlightenment. However, once you encounter a slightly adverse circumstance, your thoughts will emerge instantly. This is because you haven't cultivated the perfection of patience and haven't faced challenging circumstances. I have met such people. Since they don't associate with others, they have a pure mind. Moreover, they can understand sutras and enter concentration. Hence, they think they have already attained enlightenment. However, once they encounter a slightly adverse situation, they are defeated immediately. Their anger and other afflictions arise instantly. This is because their karma hasn't been eliminated, but stays in their storehouse consciousness, and they haven't cultivated patience. Therefore, don't assume you have attained enlightenment based on a slight sign. Spiritual attainments are verifiable. An enlightened being can remain grateful to sentient beings even under immense harm, without even a trace of anger. For example, when the king cut Xantavadan's body into pieces, he said, I don't harbour even a trace of anger. We are far from such an attainment. Even if someone scolds you with a few words, you may not bear it, not to mention being dismembered. When dismembered, Xantavadan said, I don't harbour even a trace of anger. What he said is true. In the end, his body recovered to its previous state. This is the spiritual level of the genuine Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Xantavadan achieved it through practice. This spiritual attainment is achievable. Since the body is illusory, it can recover. All phenomena are illusions, so why can't they recover? It is possible. We often consider such stories inconceivable. If your hand is cut and heals after a few months, you may consider it normal. However, if your hand is cut and recovers after five minutes, you may think it is impossible. In fact, time is relative. In the state of great Buddhas time is relative and five minutes can be equivalent to five years. Therefore, Time is not an obstacle. What we find incredible is normal in the eyes of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas as they can manifest various phenomena. For example, Ji Gong once ate a pigeon and then spat it out and the pigeon could fly. Upon hearing this, you may think it is absurd. From a causal perspective, it may seem impossible. However, it can arise through different causes and conditions. I think the pigeon Ji Gong spat out was not the same pigeon he ate, as everything is impermanent. Although it was not the original pigeon, he could manifest it. He was able to do so because everything is created by the mind. 
We may not achieve such a spiritual level, but we can believe in it. Therefore, in our spiritual practice, we should strive to fulfil the wishes of sentient beings, both in temporary and ultimate aspects. In our daily lives, we should always hold a caring and cherishing attitude towards all beings. Such practitioners truly have great compassion and loving kindness. Such a mind is the genuine manifestation of the Mahayana spirit, known as Buddhacitta. When you uproot self-grasping and vow to liberate sentient beings in our true nature, you no longer need to benefit yourself. Instead, you are constantly concerned with the liberation and happiness of all beings. Thus, you are practicing at the Buddhisattva path truly and naturally. Why is it natural? Because, in reality, there is no self. However, sentient beings are ignorant of this truth. Therefore, we shall help them overcome self-grasping and tell them that by arousing Buddhacitta, they can attain Buddhahood. Therefore, Manjushri is the wisest. You may have read Manjushri's vows. He made such an aspiration. Whoever has a karmic connection with me, may they generate Buddhacitta. Once they have aroused Buddhacitta, he no longer intervenes. He proceeds to attain Buddhahood. Hence, Manjushri possesses great wisdom. He doesn't build his own Buddha land, but all Buddha lands are his. He teaches you to generate Buddhacitta and then no longer intervenes. The great Kadampa masters of the past, such as Geshe Langri Tangpa, had a noble morality and a virtuous personality. These are the qualities that today's Mahayana practitioners should endeavour to learn. Otherwise, the aspiration to become a Buddhisattva or a Buddha will only be empty words. In today's society, most people, whether they are Buddhists or not, lack a noble personality, not to mention the great compassion and loving kindness of Mahayana. What a pity. Among Buddhist practitioners, some harbour extremely incorrect attitudes towards sentient beings. On one hand, they often treat sentient beings with anger and aversion, as if they were their enemies. On the other hand, they respect the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. This is the way of ordinary beings. When they start to believe in Buddhism, they may have some reverence towards the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas. However, they often dislike sentient beings and may even hate and harm them. In The Way of the Buddhasattva, Shantideva said, To respect only the Buddhas but not sentient beings, can such an instruction be found in the scriptures? There is no such teaching in the sutras. The statement, respect only the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas but not sentient beings, can never be found in any of the Buddha's teachings. Shantideva criticised our incorrect behaviour through a rhetorical question. In reality, if you cannot accomplish the great deed of fulfilling the wishes of sentient beings and always cherishing them, even though you seek the Dharma everywhere, you will never achieve success in your spiritual practice. This statement is also important. We need to see sentient beings as more precious than a wish-fulfilling gem from the bottom of our hearts because they are the foundation of our attainment of Buddhahood. Any suffering they inflict on us is a favourable condition for our enlightenment. 
whether sentient beings respect and support you or hurt and undermine you, you should always regard them as more precious than a wish-fulfilling gem. If you cultivate such an attitude towards all sentient beings, that is excellent. Furthermore, you should especially cultivate compassion towards those who hurt you. Fulfill the wishes of sentient beings and always cherish them with loving kindness. This statement may seem ordinary. However, without such an attitude, no matter what teaching you study, it will be in vain. Because you haven't generated bodhicitta, you don't want to help sentient beings and lack a genuine intention to benefit them. We should care for all sentient beings with loving kindness. So, it is not easy to generate bodhicitta. Can you do it? We shall wish every sentient being to attain Buddhahood and not abandon anyone. Some sentient beings may engage in evil actions that we find very dissatisfying, such as slandering the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, committing grave misdeeds or selling the Buddha. Although we may feel pain, we should still be compassionate to them. No action is more evil than these five. Even killing, stealing and sexual misconduct are not as grave as these five offences. The most severe sins are the five cardinal sins, which include selling the Buddha and causing discord among the Sangha. What are the five sins? They are killing one's father, killing one's mother, causing discord among the Sangha, which is an extremely grave sin, injuring a Buddha, selling the Buddha, and killing an Ahat. These are the most sinful actions in the world, with no greater transgressions than them. Therefore, we must be cautious and refrain from committing these five sins. Do not cause discord among the Sangha. It is an extremely grave sin. Those who do it are foolish. Even killing is not as sinful as causing discord among the Sangha. It is one of the five cardinal sins. Its negative karma is even more grave than that of killing. Causing discord among the Sangha, killing one's father and killing one's mother belong to the five cardinal sins. Therefore, we must never engage in such actions. Even towards someone who commits such sins, we should not harbour resentment. Instead, we should cultivate compassion towards them. After my lecture, you can contemplate and cultivate great compassion towards such evil beings. First, Reflect on the kindness they showed us in the past. Then, meditate on their ignorance and pathetic situation. In fact, we too have committed such sins in the past. If you wish to forgive sentient beings, you can meditate. In the past, I also committed such sins. Thanks to the compassionate Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, I became aware of these sins and stopped committing them. At least, we should be grateful to the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas and help these sentient beings. They have been our parents in past lives. Haven't we committed the five cardinal sins in the past? I bet you have. Each of us has committed such sins before. Therefore, don't harbour resentment towards them. 
when you criticize others, you are actually criticizing yourself. Don't consider yourself remarkable. For instance, you may think, I have a noble character. This is a manifestation of ego. What is there to be proud of? If you can read your past lives, you will discover that you have committed grave sins in previous lifetimes, such as killing your parents and causing disunity among the Sangha. You will realize that you were once a heinous being. Therefore, don't despise sentient beings. Although they commit such sins, you too have done it before. After learning the Buddha's teachings and returning to the right path, you no longer do it. Why are we able to stop engaging in these actions? Because thanks to the protection and guidance of the Buddhas and Buddhasattvas, we have developed a few virtuous roots and realized that we shouldn't commit such deeds. Thus, we will naturally forgive sentient beings. When you forgive sentient beings, compassion naturally arises in you. If you don't forgive sentient beings, how can you cultivate compassion? First of all, we should forgive sentient beings and not cling to any of their negative actions. Therefore, the author says, even if one seeks the Dharma everywhere, they will never achieve success in spiritual practice. Why is that? Because they lack the foundation. There is a story in the Sutra. Once upon a time, a father and a son possessed a wish-fulfilling gem. One day, while they were travelling, the father became tired and wanted to take a nap. Before lying down, he told his son, Take good care of the wish-fulfilling gem. During my nap, be sure not to give it to anyone. Soon after, the father fell asleep. At that moment, a group of thieves approached the child and asked for the wish-fulfilling gem. The child replied, My father told me not to give it to anyone. The thieves then offered him some candies, saying, The wish-fulfilling gem is useless to you, but you can enjoy these candies right now. Come on. Let's make a trade. Consequently, the child handed over the wish-fulfilling gem. When the father woke up and heard that his son had traded the wish-fulfilling gem for a few candies, he was very sad and disappointed. Similarly, once you abandon the essential principles of Dharma practice, even if you get some minor rewards, you won't attain a significant benefits. For example, once you dislike some sentient beings and harbour resentment towards them, you have abandoned bodhicitta and your so-called spiritual practice will yield very little merit at most. In other words, we can only get the merits of candies but lose the wish-fulfilling gem. We often exchange the wish-fulfilling gem for a few candies, like the child in this story. As a result, no matter what we practice, it will be in vain, and we won't receive any benefits. Therefore, we should spend some time reading biographies of great spiritual teachers from the Kadampa lineage, as well as in India the Tibetan region and the Han region, whether in the past or the present, to learn how they treated sentient beings. Hence, we can see that what this verse talks about is an ultimate and sublime pith instruction on benefiting sentient beings in Mahayana practice. This pith instruction may seem simple, 
in reality, it is the ultimate and supreme key to entering all Mahayana practices. If we embody this verse and generate such a mindset, is there any Mahayana practice we cannot accomplish? This is an essential instruction. Do not exchange the wish-fulfilling gem for candies.